Welcome to this service of worship of Westminster Presbyterian Church here on Moss Avenue in Peoria, Illinois. We hope we are planning on uh, opening our worship service to in-person worship on Sunday, September 27th. Uh, we will still uh, be live streaming the service so that the, the folks that are not um, able or are ready to come back, uh, you, that you may still see the service online. The worship bulletin for today is on the website. If you have printed out the website of the bulletin before the service begins, it, it helps in your participation in the service. If you're participating at 10 a.m. on Sunday, September 20th, I invite you to worship virtual fellowship time after the service. You can click on the link on the same page you entered the service. The password can be found in your announcement bulletin. Now let us begin with our call to worship. We gather here to worship God. Guide our minds to focus on you, O Christ. We gather here to follow Jesus. Guide our actions that they might fulfill your commandments, O Christ. We gather here to serve God. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, let us worship God. Trusting in God's mercy, let us confess our sins against God and against our neighbor. Let us pray. We confess that in writing our story, 
we have written others out. We have put ourselves first and ignored the needs of others. We have sought worldly success and fame and forgotten your commandment to love our neighbors as ourselves, to become servant of all by becoming least. Call us into your story in which love wins, the hungry are filled with good things, and justice, peace, and mercy prevail. Let us now confess our personal sins in silence. People of God, our sins are forgiven. We are reconciled to God. Let us therefore love one another with gratitude in our hearts and praise on our lips. Amen. <laughs> Let us pray. Eternal God, let the wisdom of your word rain down on us like manna and feed us, that we may be strengthened to do the work to which we are called. For the glory and honor of your name, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our Old Testament reading for today is from the book of Exodus, chapter 16, verses 2 through 15. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them, whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, in the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, 
They looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading for today is from the book of Philippians, chapter 1, verses 21 through 30. For to me, living is Christ, and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I prefer. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing. For he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well, since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. And from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. 
For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and at about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When the evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired at about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you jealous, envious, because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. The word of the Lord. Thanks. 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 How much is enough? Our scripture readings from Exodus and Matthew explore that profound and challenging question. God had performed great miracles to allow the Israelites to be freed from slavery and to flee from the pursuing Egyptian army. Yet no sooner than they were in safe territory than they began to complain. First, they didn't like the state taste of the drinking water. God directed Moses to pick up a piece of wood and throw it into the water, and the water became sweet. God seemed to be bending over backwards to demonstrate steadfast love and care for the people of the Abrahamic con covenant. Yet only 45 days into their journey through the wilderness, the Hebrews are ready to take Job's wife's advice to curse God and die. The Israelites were feeling hunger pains. They complained bitterly to Moses that they were better off as overburdened slaves. They were saying, yeah, God performed miracles to save us, but what has he done for us lately? Nobody likes whiners. So we can also relate to Moses. He had had his last nerve plucked and was ready to let them find their own way back to Egypt. As Fred Craddock, the famous preacher, recounted his father telling him when he was a child, there is no way to modulate the human voice to make a whine acceptable. But God, with infinite patience and generosity, once again gave the Hebrews all they needed and more. This time, however, God added a test. In the passage read today, God promised to provide bread in the morning and meat in the form of quails in the evening. Extending the reading, we find that to save them from their own mistrust or greed, God warned them they could not gather more than they needed for one day. If they tried to hoard more than they could consume in a day, the next day, the bread, called manna, would be unfit to eat, rotten and worm-ridden. Today we read that God demanded they rest from their labor on the seventh day, 
So God promised to send them twice as much on the sixth day, which for this one day would still be edible the next. They did not pass the test. Some went out on Sunday to see if there was more food to be collected, thus showing their lack of faith in God's promise and their disobedience to God's demand they rest on that seventh day. Reading further ahead, we also find that the Israelites did try to hoard the manna, and as God promised, their abundance was rendered inedible the next day. This was not the last time the Israelites' God was accused of not giving them enough. We can understand why God finally had had enough of their whining and made them wander in the desert for 40 years before allowing them to enter the promised land. In that special relationship the Israelites had with God, there were plenty of times when both of them were disappointed with one another. In the parable Jesus told in our gospel reading, the question of how much is enough is raised again. This is probably the most scandalous parable Jesus told. We are coveters of the highest order. Enough is not enough if someone else has more. We have a keen eye for others' advantages, but can become deaf, dumb, and blind to others' disadvantages. Jesus provides an object lesson in the difference between God's kingdom values and worldly values. In this parable, some laborers were hired to work in the vineyard early in the morning. The early hires in the vineyard of Jesus' parable got the pay for which they had agreed to work. If historians are correct in their calculations, one denaria would support the average first century family in the Roman Empire for three to six days, depending on the size of the family. This was a much better wage than minimum wage workers get now in our country. Others who came to the marketplace looking for work were hired at 9, 12, 3, and 5 in the afternoon. All received the same wages. Shocking. Like most of Jesus' parables, he deliberately doesn't give us any details about the workers hired. But based on many other passages in the Gospels, it is likely that he expected his listeners to consider more about the workers that were hired later than just the number of hours they worked. What might have been some of the reasons the others came later? We don't tend to go that deep into the parable. Immersed in American society and culture, it's so easy just to jump to the conclusion that the workers that came later were lazier than the first group. But Jesus didn't say that. He did say that the Johnny-come-lately workers explained that they weren't working when the vineyard owner encountered them at five in the afternoon because no one had hired them. Perhaps they had further to travel to get there. Perhaps their age or physical condition caused them to take longer to make the journey to the marketplace. Perhaps the early workers lived closer. Perhaps the later arriving workers had family obligations to attend to first. Perhaps there were factors such as age, gender, ethnicity, or physical appearance that made them less attractive to employers. Day laborers were common in Jesus' time. These workers were often in a more precarious situation than slaves. 
A slave would have been a long-term investment for the owner to get the best return. Day laborers were expendable and easily replaced. One would have become forced to be a day laborer by being forced off their land due to being in debt or having too small a property to provide for their family or no property at all. The day laborer was an easy target for exploitation by the hirers. Those at the bottom rung of the economic ladder were the day laborers, some slaves, the unemployable who survived by begging, women without family support, and others who were at the mercy of socioeconomic and political forces beyond their control. At the end of the day, the workers that had gotten to the marketplace first worked more hours for the same pay as the workers who had hired later, even the ones that didn't arrive until 5 p.m. Suddenly, the hours and the wages that were acceptable to the first hired were no longer good enough. Enough was no longer enough because it seemed less than what other laborers received. All the laborers received the same amount of money. But who was the least content? Who suffered? The ones who harbored resentment. I expect we have all experienced this kind of resentment before. It's a form of envy. Sometimes it's accompanied by a sense of self-righteousness, like the full day laborers had. We are taught to admire those who put in the long hours, who have never expected to gain something for nothing, and who live by the ethic of self-reliance. Yet oddly, we also admire the fabulously wealthy who have had every possible advantage to acquire their wealth. Their tax breaks and corporate bonuses, which give them millions of unearned dollars, do not bother us nearly as much as we fear a poor person might get a few extra dollars in a welfare check. Until COVID-19 pandemic, low-paid workers were not given much thought. If someone had to work two or even three jobs for themselves and their families to survive, well, it must be their fault. Then many of these low-paid workers became essential workers, and we were grateful that it was them, not us, being put on the front lines of the virus. But there were no pay raises. God's grace, however, doesn't work on the merit pay system. God is in the business of giving us enough of what we need, not more of what we want. The heart of the Abrahamic covenant with the Jews and extended to us is that we are blessed to be a blessing to others. God knows what we really need. Loving relationships, peace of mind that comes from trusting in God's faithfulness, freedom from want. Peace and contentment give us freedom from desires for more than is enough. <coughs> the Bible is clear that basing our self-worth on what we have leads to worshiping the false idols of materialism, or, as the Apostle Paul warned, the sins of the flesh lead to destruction, but the fruits of the Spirit lead to salvation. What is even more deadly is claiming our relative superiority by ensuring others have less than enough as in the case of the earlier hired laborers who begrudged the later hires what was necessary for them to support themselves and their families. P 
pitting the poor against one another was an exploitive practice of wealthy landowners in the early years of our country and is a ploy of politicians today. For tr people trapped in the cycle of poverty, demanding those who have less than their daily bread can seem like a victory, but it is a hollow victory. The spoils of this level of economic conflict go to those with the most power and wealth. What perceived entitlement, object of envy, or self-righteous resentment do you need to release yourself from to find peace and contentment in life? What gnawing anxiety over something you are afraid not to have is restricting your joy in life? Wrestling with the question of how much is enough for us is challenging. God tested the Israelites in the wilderness, but at the same time, he gave them what they needed so they would not be dependent on Pharaoh, the archetype of a worldly oppressor. Jesus tested his disciples' understanding by challenging them, as he did with the parable of the day laborers. The kingdom of God turns worldly values upside down. God's grace is an unknown factor we cannot predict or control. We can only accept it as a gift. As Paul declared, we are saved by grace through faith. God's grace is freely given, not based on what we deserve, and for that, I am truly grateful. Jesus promised reconciliation with God and to be our judge and advocate before the throne of God. I'll take that over a jury of my peers any day. Thanks be to God for whom all blessings flow. <laughs> Let us now affirm our faith using the words the Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippian congregation. Christ Jesus, 
though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess to the glory of God, Jesus Christ is Lord. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Our God is a God of compassion, slow to anger and rich in mercy, generous and forgiving to all who cry for grace. With confidence, let us turn to God in prayer, saying responsibly, in your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. I will start each of four petitions, leaving time of silence after each one. 
We pray for the church. We pray that we may be effective agents of social transformation and reliable messengers of hope. This week we pray for these sister churches in Great Rivers Presbytery, the First Presbyterian Church and Hope Presbyterian Church, both in Springfield. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for the world. We pray for people throughout the world who are suffering from hunger and homelessness, from social unrest and violence, the COVID-19 virus and its consequences. We pray for Americans on the West Coast where there has been loss of life, mass destruction of homes and property, and toxic air. Give them courage and comfort. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for all in need of healing in body, mind, or spirit. We pray for those known only to you, and for these we mention now in the silence of our hearts. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for ourselves. May we have the grace to rejoice with those who rejoice, to weep with those who weep, to grieve for others' losses to be quick to forgive and slow to take offense. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. Let us now pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Rest in the knowledge that God always provides. Therefore, give love with a generous heart, for this honors God. And may God continue to bless and keep you. Amen. Thank you.